Welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com, available on Pacifica Progressive Radio Network at opednews.com slash podcasts and at iTunes. Also uh, available on my YouTube channel, Rob Call, K-A-L-L. Uh, my guest for this show is Chris Ripple. He's a documentary filmmaker, writer, journalist, and speaker. He's a multiple Peabody and Emmy Award winning producer at CBS 60 Minutes. And he's the author of The Gatekeepers, How the White House Chiefs of Staffs Define Every Presidency. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. Fascinating book, really in it's amazing, really, uh, what, what yeah, you've right. done there in terms of the interviews that you've put together. So let's start off with a story. Well, uh, you know, it really began back in 2011 with a phone call out of the blue. My day job is as a filmmaker, and I got a phone call from Gideon Naudet uh, and his brother, um, Jules. They had done the iconic documentary 9-11 for CBS. They wanted to know if I would partner with them on a documentary about the White House Chiefs of Staff, which we did in 2013. It was a four hour film over two nights, but I really felt that that barely scratched the surface of this unbelievable untold story of these 17 living White House Chiefs who really make the difference between success and disaster for every presidency. So from 2013 until really, uh, November of last year, I went back to the chiefs of staff, having interviewed all of them, every living one once. I went back to all of them. I went to um, some of the secretaries of state. I interviewed two presidents. Uh, I talked to staffers who worked under them. You know, with the chiefs, you get the view from 30,000 feet, but I wanted the view from the ground up. And so I, I wound up doing an, another really couple of years of uh, interviewing and reporting uh, to finish the book that we're here to talk about. Well, that's really interesting. You know, I call my show Bottom Up because I believe we're in a transition from a primarily top-down culture to a more bottom-up one that uh, basically has been catalyzed by the internet and sp smartphones. And I, I have guests that give a different take, usually on Bottom Up. You know, people like the inventor of Twitter and Craig from Craigslist and Arianna Huffington, uh, or anthropologists and psychologists but you've really looked at the inner workings of the, the, the top of the top-down world. So it's well, interesting. You know, it's, it's, it's an unbelievable uh, cast of characters. You know, Aaron Sorkin couldn't have dreamed these guys up. You know, talking about Don Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney. I think most people probably even forget that those guys were chiefs of staff to Jerry Ford, all the way, all the way to the present, really up, up through Rahm Emanuel and, Dennis McDonough, and, and of course, after the election, I wrote a, an epilogue about Donald Trump, Trump in December, um, predicting that uh, if Trump did not empower a White House chief as first among equals, that he would be completely unable to govern. I take no satisfaction in that having come true, uh, but here we are. Um, so I began with those guys, you're right, and that's, as I say, the sort of the view from on high but for the book, I really went down to the, to the ground, as I say, and really talked to uh, staffers, deputy chiefs, um, as well as secretaries of state. Um, I'd, I'd interviewed every living CIA director for my film, The Spy Masters, uh, for Showtime, so I had access to those guys. So it was, uh, it, it was quite a cast of characters. So um, I'm also interested in, and, I, and I, on, on this show, I, I also interview journalists as well. And you're certainly a journalist. Uh, from the perspective of a journalist, uh, it, going from 30,000 feet to the, the, uh, the more grassroots view of these people, what were some of the things that you learned by talking to those people? Well, I, I just, it was really a matter of, of really fleshing out all of these stories. Um, you know, you can't really understand James A. Baker III, uh, Reagan's quintessential White House chief, without talking to Margaret Tutwiler, who was his deputy. And she was a, she was very close to Baker, and uh, 
she she was the one who knew all the secrets. Um, you know, I I spoke to a lot of the deputies and and a lot of the staffers, and you know, as a reporter, you just you have to do that. You can't simply you can't simply take everybody at their word and and listen to their stories as they would like them to be. Uh, memories are fallible, uh, and everybody has a self-serving spin. Uh, you know, if you're if you're the principal, if you're the subject of the book. So I wanted to go deeper and, and get the other side of the story, and, and I think I got it. Um, and I think people were remarkably candid. It's it's, it's fascinating. So what, let's what's the definition? What is a White House chief of staff? What who do they who are they? What do they do? What are their jobs? What are their roles? Well, here's the thing. I mean, the fascinating thing about it is there's nothing in the Constitution about a White House chief of staff. Uh, they're unelected and unconfirmed, hired and fired by the president alone. They really didn't exist until Dwight Eisenhower dreamed up the position uh, and, and put Sherman Adams in there, um, who was sort of the civilian version of his army chief of staff. Um, but you, it's impossible to overstate the importance of the position, uh, especially in the modern era. The White House Chief of Staff is famously the gatekeeper who controls access to the Oval Office, but that's not just controlling who comes in and out, it's really giving the President time and space to think. Um, you, he is also the so-called honest broker of information. He's the person at the end of the day who has to tee up difficult decisions with verifiable information on every side. Uh, and he has to make sure that only the most difficult decisions get into the Oval Office. He's the guy who is in charge of communication. He's the guy in charge of the communication staff, the, the speech writing staff. He's the person who is in charge of the president's message. He's the one who has to keep everybody in the, in the administration on the same page at all times. If none of this sounds familiar at the moment, <laughs> it's because, you know, we haven't had an empowered White House Chief of Staff under Donald Trump, for at least for the first six months, and we will see about General Kelly. But at the end of the day, the White House Chief is the person the President depends on to execute his agenda and turn policy, you know, thread that needle between policy and politics and turn the agenda into reality on Capitol Hill and everywhere else. And finally, and this is only a partial description of the, all the duties. But finally, the most important thing a chief does is he tells the president what he does not want to hear. He has to be the guy who can walk into the Oval Office, close the door, and tell the president hard truths. So that's just, that's just a, a short overview of what the White House chief does. Now, you, you just described somebody who is in many ways a manager, but... <laughs> subtitle of the book is the gatekeepers. So talk a little bit about their role as gatekeepers. Because the other thing that you've said is the chief of staff is one of the most powerful people in the world. Yeah, you know, I mean, James A. Baker uh, III under Reagan, who, as I say, was the, everybody's choice is the gold standard under Reagan, um, says it's the second most powerful job in government. Dick Cheney, who ought to know a thing or two about it, having been Jerry Ford's 34-year-old White House chief of staff, says that the chief has more power than the vice president. Uh, Cheney doesn't always add that that's true, except when Cheney was vice president. Uh, but in any event, it's, it really is, if you think about it, I believe those guys, that every president learns, sometimes the hard way, that you cannot govern effectively without empowering a White House chief of staff as first among equals in the White House, to execute your agenda and tell you what you don't want to hear. And it's been true at least since the days of Nixon and Haldeman that there is no such thing as cabinet government anymore. The power, power resides in the White House. And as Erskine Bowles put it to me, there's that cabal, that little cabal around the president that controls information to the president and information is power. It's been said that, in, I just saw the other day, it said that information is the most valuable thing in the world right now. Yeah, and that, and that just underscores the importance of the White House chief as the so-called honest broker 
of information. You know, probably a lot of people, including some students of uh, politics, uh, assume that in, in a situation like North Korea, that it's the national security advisor who's, who's in charge of that. Well, yes, that's true. You know, the NSC is supposed to be teeing up decisions, options for the president. But at the end of the day, it really is the White House chief's responsibility to be that honest broker who ensures that the right people are in the room at the right time making those decisions. A quick example, Jerry Ford hated his defense secretary, James Schlesinger. Couldn't stand to be in the same room with him. But Schlesinger treated him like an idiot, you know, puffing on his pipe. He was condescending and professorial and thought Jerry Ford was not very bright. Ford hated him. It was Rumsfeld's job as White House Chief of Staff to make sure that Schlesinger was in the room for important national security decisions that involved the uh, Secretary of Defense. So that's, that's a big part of the job. And, and by the way, the, the, the other thing that's striking to me about the job is the extent to which, you think about these guys, Don Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, Rahm Emanuel, these are fierce partisans. These are guys with strong ideologies, right? Absolutely. And yet, and yet all three of those guys I just mentioned were terrific chiefs of staff, in my view, because they didn't push an agenda. They were honest brokers, they executed the president's decisions, and they didn't try to steer him ideologically. Okay, so let's go there. Let's go to what, in your view, having done this in incredible research and journalistic uh, project, what, what are the most important strengths and assets and resources that a White House Chief of Staff has and brings to the job? Well, you know, there's no graduate school for White House Chiefs. There's, there's, no, there's no set of boxes that, that have to be checked off. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a job that differs also from president to president. I mean, it, there's no one size fits all template, but I will say this. I think the most effective chiefs in history have been people who knew Capitol Hill, uh, who knew how to count votes. They knew the White House. Um, and most importantly, especially I would say in the case of the two best in my mind were Jim Baker and Leon Panetta, Baker under Reagan, Panetta under Bill Clinton. Most importantly, those were guys who had been around the block, who were comfortable in their own skin. They had nothing to prove. Uh, they were able to walk into the Oval Office, close the door, and tell the president what he didn't want to hear. And that's the toughest part of the job by far. Uh, Jim Baker was a smooth as silk 50-year-old Texas attorney who had nothing to prove. And he wasn't, Reagan didn't even know him when he, when he hired him. Uh, it was a courageous choice on Reagan's part. But Reagan, who was famously described as an amiable dunce, you remember, uh, unfairly, Reagan was smart enough to know that an outsider president needs a consummate insider to get things done on Capitol Hill. And he found that guy in Jim Baker. So I would say temperament is a, an underappreciated part of the job, but absolutely critical. Uh, the same goes for Panetta. Panetta was able, he was a guy described as, Rob, Bob Reich described him to me as um, an iron fist inside a velvet glove. You know, Leon was, everybody loved Leon, that big laugh, that great Italian personality. Uh, but Leon could lower the boom when he had to. And, uh, you don't have to be the president's son of a bitch, as, as Haldeman was famously described under Nixon. Uh, but you have to be tough. You have to be able to, uh, again, have that iron fist when you need it. So it's not like there's any kind of an educational requirement or any experience. I mean, it sounds like the experience is connection with Capitol Hill. I think you need to, I think ideally you need to know the White House. I think you need to know Capitol Hill. Uh, and I think um, you have to have some experience with, with policy and with politics. And, um, you know, you have to be able to thread that needle from taking policy as 
conceived by the president and his advisors and turn it into votes on Capitol Hill, turn it into legislation, uh, know how to execute the agenda. So you've said that uh, Baker and Panetta are the, the probably the two best of the ones that you... Two, two of the best in my mind. I mean, there are other good ones as well. I mean, Dick Cheney was, was terrific. And, and one, of the, one of the great stories in the book is the story of how this you know, 34-year-old guy who was first Rumsfeld, Don Rumsfeld's protege, deputy chief of staff, and then became chief of staff for the last year of Ford's presidency, was, believe it or not, the most popular guy in town. He was the toast of Washington. Dick Cheney was the guy you wanted in a room when heads were being knocked and you had to find some kind of consensus. He was self-effacing, a wry sense of humor, a great prankster. The press corps loved him. Uh, Tom Brokaw told me that Dick Cheney was the best White House staffer he ever came across. Uh, Cheney, as chief of staff, was a straight shooter. He would always tell you what he could. Uh, off the record, if you were covering the White House. And so ever since, you know, even the chiefs of staff who, who followed him have been looking at each other saying, whatever happened to that guy? Um, and it's, and it's, there are a lot of different theories that I get into in the book. One is that it was his heart, his heart condition that changed his personality. Brett Scowcroft, who was Cheney's closest friend until they had a falling out of the Iraq war, really believes that he told me that's what a bad heart will do to you. Another theory is that he went to the dark side, so-called, uh, as CEO of Halliburton. Well, wait, wait. You're, Sco, so Scowcroft is saying that having a bad heart darkened Cheney? Turned yeah, him changed, changed him. Fundamentally changed him. Wow. Uh, you know, Scowcroft, you may recall, in the walk-up to the Iraq War, famously said of his former friend, Cheney, uh, Dick Cheney, I don't recognize anymore. Those guys were very, very close friends under Bush 41 when Cheney was defense secretary and, uh, and Scowcroft was national security advisor. Uh, they were thick as thieves. Uh, they had a real falling out over Iraq. And uh, Scowcroft attributes some of it to his, to his heart condition. Um, you know, I, my own personal theory, and if you, if you ask my friend David Kennerly, who was his White House photographer, and as one of his closest friends in the world, uh, Kennerly would tell you it's all BS, you know, that, that he's the same guy he's always known, hasn't changed a bit. But obviously his, his, the way he carried himself changed as vice president under W. My own theory about it is that it was the last stop on Cheney's railroad when he was vice president under Bush. He wasn't pursuing any other higher office uh, he had nothing to lose, and he could tell people exactly what he thought of. <laughs> now, have, did, did, did you interview him before or after he was vice president? Have you, for the book, I mean. Have yeah, you, for the book, I interviewed him after he was vice president. I interviewed him. I spent many, many hours with Cheney, uh, multiple interviews uh, in his home in McLean, Virginia, and his place in Wyoming. Um, gotten to know him pretty well. Um, I actually interviewed him for four and a half hours straight um, one Friday in, uh, I'm trying to remember where it was now, but it, whether it was East Coast or West Coast, I don't recall now. But he, he probably, I was exhausted. He probably could have kept going. And he had a new heart? And two days later, he had a heart transplant. So he had a mechanical heart when you interviewed him. He had a mechanical heart at that time. Well, it wasn't a mechanical heart, actually, not technically. But he did have, you know, he would open his, you know, he would open his jacket and show you all the wires uh, that were keeping his heart pumping at that point. And was and he? Say, he went, he could talk to you about his days as Jerry Ford's White House chief for hours and hours. He loved that period of his life. That was his, those, those were the golden days as far as Cheney's concerned. So he, it's, it's fascinating. It's, he's probably the only guy who's been chief of staff and vice president. That's right. That's correct. So he's had both. And, and would he agree that chief of staff is more powerful? Or I, mean, he, he, I think being chief of staff, he knew how to do it differently. He's the one who told me that chief of staff, as he put it, 
White House Chief of Staff has more power, if you want to put it in those terms, than the Vice President. Uh, as I say, I, my own opinion is, except of course, when he was Vice President. And I think that for Andy Card, Andy Card almost had Mission Impossible. He, uh, I, I admire Andy Card, and I think he was really capable, and I think he did a, he did a good job at, at, as he defined it. The way Card defines the job is, you want to make sure the president is never hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. <laughs> I think Andy Card was great at that. But I think that Andy was up against two savvy, powerful political operators in Dick Cheney as vice president and Don Rumsfeld, the secretary of defense. And I think it, it made it very difficult for Andy to, to be the honest broker as the Iraq war approached. That's another story I tell in the book. And by the way, an untold story about how James Baker and George Bush 41 were so alarmed by the way 41's son, W, had cut out Colin Powell uh, in the decision making as the Iraq war approached. They were so alarmed by the way Colin Powell had been cut down to size that 41, instead of confronting his son, Baker, James Baker, went privately, secretly to Colin Powell and told him to go in and tell W to fall on his sword, uh, that, to threaten to resign. That they, they said, Colin, he said, Colin, you've got to go in and tell, tell the president that this is not what you signed up for. And as Baker put it to me, he never did that. Yeah. I started my website because of Colin Powell uh, when he talked to the UN about the weapons of mass destruction. And I, I had Larry Wilkerson on the show a couple times, and it was the most thing they were most ashamed of that they ever did. That's Colin, I, my interview with Colin Powell is, 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 I think, really I mean, remarkable. I mean, I have to say it was, it's one of the best interviews in the book uh, because when I relayed this story, to Colin Powell from James Baker that Baker had never told before about this going to Colin Powell. Um, he was not a happy camper. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a riveting, it was a riveting phone call. It was a good 40 minute phone call I had with General Powell. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it, most of it is in that chapter. And it was, it was memorable. What's the chapter? It's the chapter, uh, it describes Bush 41, I'm sorry, Bush 43 and Andy Carr. Uh, it, it's really the Bush administration chapter, Bush 43. Okay. So I've uh, got to do an ID. This is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by Op-Ed News, available on Pacifica, Progressive Radio Network, iTunes, and on YouTube on the Rob Call Op-Ed News channel. I am interviewing Chris Whipple. He's the author of the Gatekeepers, How the White House Chiefs of Staff Define Every Presidency. Chris is a multiple Peabody and Emmy Award winning producer at CBS's 60 Minutes. And we've been talking about the Chiefs of Staff. So you said something that Andy Card said that was interesting. He said you want to make sure that you keep the uh, president not hungry, not angry, not lonely. And what was the last one? Tired. Lonely? And that sounds like, it makes me think of Bill Clinton, frankly. <laughs> well, no, I don't think that was the concern with 43. Uh, that, I don't think it was the same concern. But I do think that you know, what Card was talking about was really, you have to, to some extent, you have to be the person who looks after the president, not just, not just as he does his job, but I think you have to take his temperature uh, psychologically. I think you have to be sensitive to his moods. I think, um, I think they all were with Clinton as well. I mean, they, they, you know, when Clinton had his purple rage, his so-called purple rages, when he blew up uh, in the morning over something that annoyed him, uh, you had to wait for him to come down off the ceiling, as Leon Panetta put it, because it was good therapy for him. You let him do it. And five minutes later, he'd be saying, He'd calm down and he'd say, okay, what do we have to do? Um, so, you know, every president, God knows, the current president um, is, a, is, a, is a handful for uh, General Kelly, for sure. 
Okay, uh, well, let's talk about Trump. I mean, he's the, uh, I don't know, call him an elephant, whatever in the room. Uh, yeah, Trump. Yeah, you had Rems Priebus, you got General Kelly. Have there been other generals who have been White House Chief of Staff? Yeah, and, and the only precedent is is not that encouraging, to be honest. Uh, the last, the only general to be White House Chief in the modern era was Alexander Haig, who uh, lasted a little over a month as Jerry Ford's White House Chief after Richard Nixon resigned. He was, of course, Nixon's uh, last Chief of Staff after H.R. Haldeman went off to prison. Um, but Haig lasted a little more than a month. He was... Uh, he was arrogant, he was imperious, uh, and he just clashed with all of Jerry Ford's, uh, you know, civil pipe-smoking, tweedy uh, advisors that he brought with him. Uh, it was a disaster. And within a month, Jerry Ford was begging his old pal, Don Rumsfeld, uh, who was actually a rather, rather young man, but uh, old friend, uh, to come in and whip the White House into shape, which, which Rumsfeld did uh, with help from his, uh, his young protege, Cheney. So what do you think of Kelly? But let me also give you another, uh, um, there's, a, there's another side to that coin of uh, the last time we had a general as White House Chief of Staff. And it might be, to mix my metaphors, it might be a page that uh, General Kelly wants to think about taking from Haig. During the final days, when Richard Nixon was drinking heavily, talking to the oil portraits in the West Wing, uh, behaving bizarrely, Al Haig and James Schlesinger, the Secretary of Defense, uh, took pains to see that the nuclear codes could not be triggered without their knowledge. And they did it because Nixon was so erratic and because he was drinking heavily, um, and they didn't have the authority to do it, they just did it. How? They just did it. They just decided. Uh, they just decided that that was the prudent thing to do. And so I would suggest that, you know, we may not be that far away from a time when General Kelly may have to uh, think about the same thing. I mean, if there, if if we continue to have a president who who tweets. Uh, nonsense uh, and who makes who tweets nuclear the threats of nuclear war uh, in, a, in, in crises with countries around the world uh, it's not that far-fetched to imagine a day when Kelly might have to uh, think about similar precautions now in your book you also talk about smart presidents too and uh, you take you you have takes on the different presidents as well yeah, well, you know, here, take, speaking of smart presidents, I mean, take, take Jimmy Carter for a minute, because Carter is a cautionary tale. Carter was arguably the most intelligent president of the 20th century. He was trained as a nuclear engineer. He could assimilate vast amounts of information and distill it into policy. Um, you know, he was on paper just absolutely brilliant. Um, Carter thought he was so smart that he could run the White House by himself. And so he didn't appoint a White House chief of staff. Part of that was because he thought that H.R. Haldeman, Nixon's uh, powerful, empowered White House chief, uh, symbolized, personified everything that was wrong with the Nixon White House. He, he, he essentially took the wrong lesson from the Nixon White House. Uh, and he thought he could run the White House by himself. He tried, and two and a half years in, uh, he was really paralyzed. I mean, he was unable to prioritize. He was unable to really govern effectively. Um, he was persuaded that he had to appoint a White House chief, and, and he gave Hamilton Jordan the title and the responsibility. Now, you know, I've, uh, I've interviewed uh, Howard Gardner. He wrote, he's, he came up with this theory of multiple intelligences, that it's not just math or language that you're smart with. Here you got a guy, Jimmy Carter, who's the smartest of all the presidents, and it wasn't enough. What kind of smarts are needed to be president and chief of staff? Well, you know, it, maybe it's emotional intelligence. Uh, you know, 
Ronald Reagan, by contrast, was famously called an amiable dunce. Uh, but Reagan intuited something that Carter never understood, which is that, again, that an outsider president really needs a consummate insider to help you get things done on Capitol Hill. And he found that in James Baker. Now, he had help. Nancy Reagan uh, was blown away by Baker. She was impressed by him. Stu Spencer, who was the elder statesman and the, the, uh, the, the, the campaign manager for Reagan, uh, both, both persuaded Reagan that you got to look at this guy, Jimmy Baker. Uh, Baker came along and, uh, and, and rode around with him on the campaign plane, and, uh, and Reagan said, he's my guy. Well, that was a courageous choice by Reagan, and it was, but it came from his gut, maybe. Um, you know, because on paper, Reagan and Carter were just not comparable. I mean, Carter was, uh, you know, had so much more going for him intellectually, uh, but Reagan understood something more important. I hope that General Kelly reads your book. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know if he has. I, I, I haven't heard from General Kelly. I, I suspect, I'm pretty sure that he's talked to James Baker. I know he's talked to Leon Panetta, um, but uh, you know the first thing Baker. If, I mean, if you're, if you know what you're doing as White House chief of staff, the first phone call you make is to Jim Baker, and Baker's Baker always says the same thing when he gets that call, yeah. which is congratulations, you've got the worst blanking job in government. <laughs> and then he goes on, of course, to try to be more constructive with his advice. Um, Panetta famously told Kelly that he should go out and buy a big bottle of scotch. The first thing. I, I suspect that that bottle is long gone by now. Uh, and what, what's it been? A couple of weeks? Uh, yeah, maybe two. So what, what other advice do they give? What serious advice do they give? Well, um, there's a great, that's a, that's a great segue to the opening chapter of, of the book, which is my, maybe my favorite. And it, and it was a cold De December morning in 2008. Um, Josh Bolton, who was the outgoing chief of staff for George W. Bush, thought it would be helpful and interesting to invite the white, former White House chiefs to the White House to give advice to the incoming chief, Rahm Emanuel, who was about to start with Barack Obama. He thought maybe he'd get a handful of chiefs to show up. 13 living ex-White House chiefs of staff came to the White House that morning and they filed into Josh Bolton's office, soon to become Rahm Emanuel's office. They sat around a long table. At one end was Dick Cheney. At the other end was Don Rumsfeld. The first piece of advice to Rahm came from Ken Duberstein, who was Reagan's final chief of staff. And he looked at Rahm and said, never forget, when you open your mouth, it's not the president who's speaking. It's not you who's speaking. It's the president of the United States, to which Rahm said, oh, black, of course. Uh, they went around the table. They finally got to Cheney. Cheney looked up. Cheney, who was still the sitting vice president of the United States at the time, looked up over his glasses at Rahm and said gravely, at all costs, control your vice president, <laughs> which, brought down, which brought down the house. Um, but in between, there was some serious advice. And, and, I, and, and it, was, it, was, it was interesting because Mac McLarty was told Rom that never forget uh, your humanity. You have to, you have to remember um, not to think that you've got all the answers. Uh, there was quite a, quite a wide variety of advice, but I think all of them agreed that the White House chief has no chance unless he has the confidence of the president and is empowered as first among equals in the White House. I think that was a consistent message. Now, fast forward to 2016, December of 2016, Dennis McDonough, who was Ram, who was uh, Barack Obama's final chief, decided to ex extend the same privilege to uh, Reince Priebus, the incoming chief. There were something like 
not nearly as many of them showed up, but there was a pretty good group of them who came to give Priebus advice. They all told Priebus the same thing. You have to be empowered by Donald Trump to have a chance. Um, and they all left thinking that's never going to happen, uh, quite frankly. And guess what? It didn't happen. So the big question in my mind now is, um, did Trump learn anything in the first six months? Uh, has, he, has he really empowered uh, Kelly in a way that he, the previous never was? Uh, because he has no chance of governing unless, unless Kelly can, can be the empowered white SG. Now, you've got me really thinking, uh, the president's the, the most powerful man. He's got an incredible amount of responsibility, but and I, I didn't realize that, that it wasn't until Dwight Eisenhower created the, the position. Is, is this something that heads of big corporations have or could use, or even of non, big, big yeah. nonprofits? I mean, it seems like a model, it's a very top-down model, but it's also a model that uh, seems to be almost like an essential part in handling, throttling, modulating the, the power and the inter interaction between. Look, I, you know, I don't come from the corporate world, but, uh, but Erskine Bowles did uh, before he became Clinton's very effective White House chief. Bowles was, um, was the third chief succeeding uh, Leon Panetta uh, under Clinton. And Bowles was a brilliant businessman, entrepreneur. entrepreneur. Uh, it kind of became a parlor game in the West Wing. How, how many millions of dollars did Erskine give up to come and do this job? Um, but anyway, Bowles, Bowles says that the White House chief's job is, is a lot like the COO, the chief operating officer. You know, every CEO needs a COO to execute his agenda. Um, the CEO can't do it all. Um, you've got to have somebody who's empowered. And, and again, I... I don't come from the corporate world, so I can't speak for that. But, but Bowles certainly felt there was that analogy. Um, Bowles was a guy, his mantra was organization, structure, and focus. And he, there's a great story that he tells in the book about, you know, every morning Bill Clinton would come out of his office with another great idea. And Bowles said, and he had a thousand great ideas. Uh, that was what Bill Clinton was good at. Every time he came out I, and would tell me his idea, I would grab him by the shoulder, turn him around, walk him back into the Oval and say, Mr. President, I told you a thousand times, you agreed that we were going to do two or three things. And if you stick to those two or three things, I can provide the organization structure and focus to get them done. But you can't do a thousand things. And a guy who has a thousand ideas, um, you know, he's no better than a dummy like me who has no ideas. Anyway, Bowles, Bowles was very good at focusing the president. Every president has got to have discipline and focus and prioritize. And one of the huge problems with this White House, the current White House, is that nobody has any idea what the president's agenda is. Maybe the president has no idea. Certainly no one else does. You were on MSNBC today. Yes. A comment about the presidency so far. We, yeah. Well, we talked about how two weeks ago, this was the most dysfunctional White House in modern history. Uh, and John Kelly was supposed to change all that, right? That was the narrative. Well, uh, not so much. You know, it's been one self-inflicted crisis after another, after another. And, um, you know, Kelly came in saying that he was going to manage. I thought this was a, a big mistake if he meant it. What he said was, reportedly, I'm just going to ma manage the staff. I'm not going to manage the president. Well, if you're White House Chief of Staff, you don't have a choice. You have to manage both. You have to be able to walk into the Oval Office, as Leon Panetta did and Jim Baker did, and tell the president hard truths. Um, you know, the first thing he did, which was encouraging, was he grabbed that idiot Scaramucci and he threw him over the White House wall. Now, that was, that was a no-brainer. 
uh, but it was a good first move. He seems to have brought some discipline to the White House staff. The door to the Oval Office seems to be closed more than it has been. Right. He seemed to be reporting through him. But at the end of the day, he's got, you know, maybe Mission Impossible in the form of a guy named Donald Trump. Uh, he's got to bring focus and discipline to the Oval Office, and this is a guy for whom focus and discipline are anathema. What would you advise? So what do you do as White House Chief? What do you advise Trump on how to use a chief of staff? Well, I, I would advise him. I would tell him what I think the book, my book, really shows. The overarching lesson from the book, one of them, is that every president learns often the hard way that you have to empower a White House chief to execute your agenda and tell you what you don't want to hear. Um, but let's assume, so that's one lesson from the book. Um, another lesson from the book is, you know, in Hollywood, they say nobody knows anything. Uh, in Washington, you could rephrase that slightly. Nobody learns anything. And one of the, reason, one of the reasons presidents don't learn anything when they come in is because they're full of hubris, they're intoxicated by their electoral triumph, uh, perhaps this president more than any, and yes. they think they're the smartest guy in the room. Um, that's fatal. I mean, you have to be able to listen to hard truths. The other, the other major lesson of the book, I think, is that Governing is tough. You know, governing is nothing like running a Manhattan real estate firm in Manhattan. Um, it's nothing like campaigning. And for Trump, so far, this has been the perpetual, eternal campaign. Um, Ken Duberstein said, um, he was Reagan's final chief. He liked to say about Reagan that, you know, when you're campaigning, you try to annihilate your opponents. When you're governing, you have to make love to them. You have to build coalition. You have to expand your base. Uh, you cannot govern effectively by simply pouring gasoline on, onto the grievances of your base. You, you, you have to expand your support. Um, this is completely foreign to Trump. Trump has no idea how to do that. And the first six months are proof that he, he evidently cannot do that. So I would say... Talk to Trump. Talk to Trump. What do you say to him? I would say, I would say respectfully... Well, first of all, I said this months ago, uh, and, and that was I, I thought that... You know, one former chief told me that presidents... It's a little bit like alcoholism. Presidents have to hit rock bottom before they're ready to accept change. Uh, it took Bill Clinton a year and a half to figure out that he had to empower a new White House chief of staff and give him the authority to do what needed to be done. It took Jimmy Carter two and a half years to figure out that he needed a White House chief of staff. I said that Donald Trump needs a kind of intervention, and I'm not sure who who would be in this intervention? Uh, would it be Ivanka and Jared and Melania and, and uh, Kelly? I don't know. But somebody needs to go in and close the door and tell Donald Trump the following. <clears throat> you have a choice. Your White House is broken. The last six months are proof. Of that. You have a choice. If you want to be Jimmy Carter, just keep doing exactly what you're doing because you will serve one term or less. If you want to be Ronald Reagan, you've got to do what Reagan learned how to do, and that is empower a White House chief of staff. And I would go further and say, you also have to learn how to govern. Governing is nothing like campaigning. You can't threaten people uh, or, or just tweet insults at them um, that's not the way government works. You have to build coalitions. 
you have to reach out and give people a reason to follow you. It's not like running for the nomination. It's fascinating because, well, I got, let me do an ID first. This is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by Op-Ed News, on Pacifica, Progressive Radio Network, iTunes, and you can access it at opednews.com slash podcast. I've been interviewing Chris Whipple, the author of The Gatekeepers, How the White House Chiefs of Staff Define Every Presidency, and he's an award-winning Emmy and Peabody Award winning producer for uh, 60 Minutes. So you've, you've said a lot of times that White House Chiefs of Staff have to empower, have to be empowered by the president. And then you just said that, that they've got to basically learn how to govern, which is about handing, giving out power. So you've got the most powerful person in the world and what you're really saying is the only way that you can effectively use that power is if you spread it around. No, I'm not saying that. I mean, it's not, it's not about spreading power around. It's, I mean, you, you accumulate, you expand your power if you persuade people to follow you. But you can't, you can't simply threaten people or annihilate them or demonize them, which is Trump's instinct. Now, it got him the nomination. There's a reason why he does this because he's done it all his life and because it got him the nomination and it got him the presidency. And he's not the first president to make the mistake of thinking, of being full of hubris and thinking, oh, it's all about me and my goodness and my brilliance and I'm the smartest guy in the room. He's, in fairness to him, he's not the first, pers first president to think that. But every other president has learned, sometimes the hard way, that you can't govern effectively by simply continuing to campaign and demonizing your opponents. You've got to reach out and build a coalition. You can't govern with 30% of the population. You have to expand it. That's well, I, 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 I understood that. I, but but I want to get into this empowerment idea. You know, you've, it's, it's, it's the number one thing that you've said is what a president needs to do to be successful is to empower the chief of staff. Right. What does that mean? What are the well to do all the things that I just to do to do all the things that I described earlier? You've got to have at the at the, you know the gatekeeper, the honest broker, all of those things. But most importantly, he's the guy who executes the agenda, and you have to have you can have you can have robust debates. You can have the Reagan White House was Reagan famously called it a zoo. I mean, you had internecine warfare. You had ideological debate. You had the, you know, the, the, the true believers, the let Reagan be Reagan folks, and then you had the pragmatists under Baker, and they, and they had fierce debates. But at the end of the day, when Reagan made a decision, everybody fell in line behind the White House chief to execute the policy. And as, you know, as, as Erskine Bowles uh, told me, you know, you had to make sure that if Bob Reich was saying one thing one day in Berkeley, that Bob Rubin was on the same page on Wall Street. You had to make sure everybody was, everybody fell in place behind the decision. The Obama White House, you know, Rahm Emanuel himself argued against Obamacare. He wanted, he'd been burned in the Clinton White House with Hillary Care, and he wanted to go with a less ambitious plan. But when Obama decided that he wanted it all in on a, on a more ambitious plan, uh, Emmanuel saluted, got it passed, did everything he had to do, uh, got all the votes on the Hill, cut deals with everybody who needed to cut a deal, and got Obamacare passed. That's what I mean by empowering somebody to be, as we talked about before, in effect, the sort of COO for the president. Okay. Doesn't mean he's more powerful than the president. Doesn't mean he's making decisions for the president. As I said at, at, in the beginning, uh, the really effective ones, including Rumsfeld, Cheney, Emanuel, guys who were ideologues, guys who were true believers in their causes, they didn't try to steer the decisions toward their own point of view. They were honest brokers. Talk a little bit about Priebus. What happened there? A couple of things with Priebus. Um, first of all, Priebus was friendly with Paul Ryan. 
uh, which was supposed to be an asset, but he didn't really know the hill that well. He was, uh, you know, he was an effective, uh, he was effective at the RNC, um, but he didn't know the White House. And he was, at the end of the day, he was a sycophant. He was unable to tell Donald Trump hard truths. Uh, the most egregious example of that was that a surreal cabinet meeting in which everybody tried to be more obsequious than the other. And, and Priebus was the, the sycophant in chief. But in fairness, so look, no competent White House chief of staff would ever allow an executive order on immigration to be essentially written on the back of an envelope and sent out into the world without being vetted by the departments that are in charge of executing. And that's the kind of thing that went on <clears throat> for six months and, and on, on his watch. Um, this was a guy who made rookie mistake after rookie mistake. Of but course, if Trump it, did not empower him, then it wasn't. Well, in fairness to Rebus, I was just about to say, it, he never had a chance, even if he had been somebody who could tell, speak hard truths, he never had a chance because Donald Trump never had any intention of empowering him. Trump didn't understand the job. Um, you, have to really, you have to really wonder about a guy like Donald Trump who, who says when, they, when he appointed Kelly, he said, he's going to be the greatest White House chief of staff in history. Except Donald Trump can't name more than two or three White House chiefs in history. Uh, mm -hmm. He didn't understand the job. He never empowered Priebus. So Priebus never had a chance, frankly. You know, there's a new management approach, which is non-hierarchical. And what's, it's being used with hundreds of companies. The biggest one is Zappos. It's a billion dollar company. And it's, what's different is that people throughout the organization are given a lot of power, basically empowered. Yeah. And, uh, my impression is that it takes a certain kind of a, a corporate head to feel safe doing that. And well, you know, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that it, it, no one was empowered except the chief in, the, in these functioning White Houses. Um, I think that under Baker, under Dennis McDonough, under, under a number of empowered chiefs, um, they delegate. I mean, they delegate to the smartest people they can find. But, but my point is, my point is that the, the, the CEO has to have the trust and has to have the self-confidence to let go of the control in order to, to share the power. Absolutely. No question about it. And, you know, I think that was Jimmy Carter's, one of Jimmy Carter's fatal flaws. Uh, he had, he had, a, had a lot of very, very bright people around him. And one of the great stories I tell in the book is uh, of a guy named Jack Watson, who was uh, a young, charismatic, brilliant smooth operator who was uh, in charge of Jimmy Carter's transition and should have been, in my view, and a lot of other people who were there at the time, uh, probably should have been as chief of staff on day one. Had he been, maybe Carter would have had a very different experience. But to go back to your idea of, um, of horizontal <clears throat> instead of uh, vertical uh, management structures, now Jerry Ford tried that. Uh, he, he had a lot of advisors, all of them equal in rank, coming and going from the Oval Office. He called it the spokes of the wheel with Ford at the center. It was a disaster. And one of my favorite stories is how on the very last day of Cheney's, uh, before when Cheney was White House chief, they had long ago abandoned this notion of the spokes of the wheel. He finds a package beautifully wrapped gift on his desk. He unwraps it and inside he finds a mangled bicycle wheel with every spoke broken. <laughs> and Cheney thought, Cheney loved it. He thought it symbolized everything that was wrong with Jerry Ford's initial idea. Anyway, instead of taking it home and putting it on the garage shelf, he, he suddenly had a thought and he left it on his desk for his, for his successor to find later that day. His successor being Hamilton Jordan, and he wrote a note, Dear Hamilton, beware the spokes of the wheel, Dick Cheney. And of course, Big story. Carter and Ham Jordan ignored his advice because in Washington, as I said before, nobody learns anything. Yeah. 
Well, we're getting near the end of the interview. I wanted to ask you about CC Whip Productions. What's that? That's that's my production company. You're looking at it. I mean, I'm I'm the production company. I, I I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly. Um, you know, I do I do hire people when I'm when I'm actually out shooting films. But um, it's I've had it since I left ABC News. I was there for 19 years after 60 Minutes. I went out and launched my own production company, and and I did my first production was with uh, my partner Jules and Gideon Naudet, I mentioned before, uh, who did 9-11. We did a four-hour documentary on the White House Chiefs for the Discovery Channel back in 2013. Most recently, we did a film called The Spy Masters, uh, CIA and the Crosshairs, in which uh, I interviewed every living CIA director, from starting with George Bush 41, uh, and going all the way up to John Brennan. What'd you learn? A hell of a lot. Those guys have a lot to uh, have a lot to tell you. I mean, it's George Tennant alone was worth worth the price of admission. He hadn't done an interview in eight years. Uh, we covered and imagine so. Imagine this: it's, he's a Shakespearean character in my mind because you know, imagine having on your watch the walk up to 9-11, the, what some would say were ignored warnings that the CIA gave the Bush White House about 9-11. 9-11 itself, the invasion of Afghanistan, the Iraq war, and the weapons of mass destruction, all on your watch. Wow. Uh, so I spent something like five hours with Tenet. We weren't sure how long he would stay or whether he would bolt after an hour from the chair. But he stayed for a good five hours, and we covered the entire span. And um, it was absolutely fascinating. So one thing you learned from interviewing them all. At the end of the day, I thought the most, the most profound observation was, came from maybe John Brennan and Michael Hayden. And they essentially said, and a number of others hinted at this, that no matter how much you rely on the Central Intelligence Agency, no matter how much you, um, money you throw at them, no matter, no matter how much covert warfare you wage or intelligence you collect, um, at the end of the day, all the, all the CIA can do, all any intelligence agency can do is give you time and space time and space to solve the underlying problems that give rise to Al-Qaeda and ISIS and all the others. And we got a wrap. There's no magic bullet. We got a wrap. This has been the Rob Call Bottom Up Show on Pacifica, Progressive Radio Networks, iTunes, at opednews.com slash podcast. I've been talking to Chris Whipple, the author of The Gatekeepers, now the White House Chiefs of Staff define every presidency. Thanks, Chris. It's been great to have you. It's been my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.